Hello and welcome to week 5, part 4 of EGM 703, Other Applications of GPR. In this lesson, we'll look at applications of GPR to fields beyond archaeology and glaciology. In particular, we'll discuss how GPR can be applied to studies in construction and civil engineering before looking at pollution monitoring and disposal, followed by examples of geological mapping and permafrost studies. A common thread that we've seen with GPR applications is their use to map or identify buried objects, and the same is true for construction projects, where GPR is used to map things like pipes, wires and cables, and buried contaminants. An increasingly common commercial application of GPR is to evaluate the condition of existing structures or materials. For example, uh, for example we can look at cracks in concrete or cement, or study the corrosion of rebar reinforcements that are used in concrete structures. GPR can also be used to study road conditions. Using a GPR instrument mounted to the front of a van or a truck like this one, for example, engineers can drive along a road to observe and map the road condition. Some of the things that can be seen with GPR under the road surface are areas where the road has settled. For example, this figure shows where old road surfaces have settled over time as the peat underlying the roadbed has also settled. GPR can also be used to detect cracks in the road before they reach the surface, which can help engineers identify areas that are in need of repair before they actually show up on the surface. The dielectric constant for a number of common pollutants has a very high contrast to the dielectric constant for water. For example, trichloroethylene has a dielectric constant of 3.42, while for perchloroethylene, or PCE, it's even lower at 2.28. Because of this contrast, we can use GPR to detect contaminants in the subsurface, especially if they are replacing water. In the figure here, which shows a controlled spill of PCE, we see a pre-spill reflection in the sand layer. And as the spill progresses, we can see the changes in the reflection that indicate how the contaminant pools near this boundary, then continues moving downward and pooling at lower levels in the sand. We can also use GPR to detect the boundary between the unsaturated and saturated zones, in other words, the start of the water table. And once we've mapped the contaminant, we can also work on determining how best to treat the contaminant, either by excavating and removing it, or by working to contain it. By comparing GPR surveys over time, it is also possible to monitor how contamination levels are changing over time. While some pollutants increase reflection, Others will increase conductivity or attenuation in a GPR image. This image shows a GPR survey for a contaminated area before a remediation project. The main source of contamination here is dissolved chloride ions, which greatly increase the attenuation of the radar signal at certain frequencies. This site is downstream of a landfill. The landfill is leaching contaminants into the water table, and as the water flows through the subsurface, the pollutants are carried along with it. Five years after initial steps were taken to remediate the pollution using pumping well remediation strategies, the GPR signal has changed dramatically. We still see some areas with some high attenuation, but the overall improvement here is readily apparent. One of the goals of sedimentology is to reconstruct past deposition and erosion patterns and to study sedimentary processes that often occur on typically long time scales. One example of a type of event that occurs on very short time scales are coastal changes after hurricanes. Large amounts of sediment can be deposited or eroded over the course of hours to days. The examples shown here are from a study that used GPR to map sand deposition on barrier islands in the aftermath of a few different hurricanes. In the figure on the upper right, we can see the presence of woody debris in the sand, which show up as hyperbolic reflectors in the GPR image. In the GPR image, we can also see the bottom of the new sediment layer, the washover, 
labeled here, as well as the location of the water table. In the other image, we can see where multiple hurricanes have left deposits mapped using the excavation trends shown here, as well as the GPS transects. And we can even see where some of the overwashed sediments have extended below the measured water table. So the observed differences in erosion or deposition processes defend, depend on factors like the coastline morphology, the presence or type of vegetation in the area, and the properties of the sediment. So these can all have an impact on what we see with the GPR. Frozen ground has less attenuation of radar signals relative to unfrozen ground, which makes GPR a great tool for studying permafrost. The active layer is the surface layer that thaws each summer and refreezes during the winter. Below the active layer, we have permafrost, which remains frozen throughout the year. The active layer is often char characterized by different physical properties compared to permanently frozen soil, which means that the boundary between the active layer and the permafrost can be mapped using GPR. Here, the black line around 20 to 30 centimeters depth indicates the bottom of that active layer. Within permafrost, we can also see different ice structures, such as ice wedges or ice lenses. Now, these are layers of ice that grow over time, but because they're nearly pure ice within a soil matrix, they show up as very strong scatterers in the radargram. So in this radargram, we see two such features which are outlined by the black circles. Another geophysical method, measuring electrical resistivity or resistance, helps us to estimate water content, temperature, and other properties of permafrost. With probes inserted into the ground, we induce an electric current and measure the voltage at other locations. This lets us measure the resistivity of the medium, which tells us something about the properties of the medium. In permafrost, sediment with a low ice content tends to have low resistivity, while sediment with higher ice content tends to have higher resistivity, though it's still lower than the resistivity for ice. Like we saw with magnetometry surveys in the lesson on archaeological applications, by combining GPR and electrical resistivity surveys, we can increase the quality of our data as well as our, inter our interpretations about the subsurface. In the example shown here from a 2008 study by DePascale and others, we can see how overlying the radar gram with the results of a resistivity survey helps to clarify the interpretation. In the upper panel, we see a few areas where the GPR survey potentially indicated the presence of ice. However, the electrical resistivity study either help to confirm or reject these different conclusions. So again, by combining multiple complementary methods, we can in effect get the best of both of these approaches. In this lesson, we've seen how GPR has many different applications beyond archeology span and glaciology. We've also seen how in addition to studying natural processes, we can also use GPR to study the subsurface environment in situ whether for building or construction projects or studying contaminated environments. And we've also seen how combining GPR with other complementary geophysical methods can enhance our interpretation and understanding of the subsurface environment. As always, I've included links for the different articles referenced in the presentation here, and they're also available by links in the slide notes, and you can find PDF versions of the articles on the Zotero library. I've also included a, f a few additional papers in the Zotero library that weren't covered here, so feel free to browse those as well. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!